Policy has such tremendous impact on the trajectory of people's lives. And so to engage in policy at a fundamental level on something as profound as uh, Web3 and the blockchain and crypto, we are shaping what's going to happen for my great-grandchildren's generation. Sheila Warren is the CEO at the Crypto Council for Innovation. Warren served as the head of data, blockchain, and digital assets at the World Economic Forum. She began her career as a Wall Street attorney before turning to philanthropy and civic technology. Warren currently co-hosts Coindesk's top show, Money Reimagined, and serves as a member on several crypto and financial industry boards. Her pioneering policy work is helping shape the data and technology spaces to be more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. Welcome everybody to our next episode of Speak Bold, our fireside chat series here at Stronghold. I'm really excited to have our next guest here with us today, Sheila Warren. Um, and she's an also fellow San Franciscan, and so we're so happy to have you here today with us. Tell us about yourself and how you got into crypto. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tammy, for having me. It's so great to be here. Yeah, I, you know, I think we all have these really unique stories, and mine is no different. Um, I actually came into crypto and the blockchain space through a data side, a data, a data lens, not so much Bitcoin and finances. I was the general counsel of a social enterprise called TechSoup, and we had a big database of nonprofit organizations all around the world. And as GDPR was approaching a new rule in Europe around data protection, I was very concerned about whether our data was going to be in compliance with these new rules and also how this data could be as, as secure as possible. I was very concerned about that. And so uh, someone told me about blockchain and I read up on it and then I realized it was, it was Bitcoin. I realized those were, you know, Bitcoin was a, the first application essentially killer app of a blockchain protocol. Went down the rabbit hole like so many of us did, and here we are. Wow, that is an interesting, <laughs> a little different, yeah. <laughs> background, and it sounds like yeah, you have a law background, which I also didn't know. <laughs> I do. Exciting. Yeah, I started off on Wall Street doing corporate M and A and international tax law, and then I moved out to the Valley. Oh, gosh, longer ago than I can even remember. Almost twenty years ago, I feel like. At this point, maybe like 17 years ago, I came out here to focus on civic tech and philanthropy law because I was really interested in how challenging it is to give money away across borders. So I've had this interest in the movement oh, of money across borders for a long time. And that kind of just kind of just all converged. It, it all converges <laughs> yeah. now because, um, you know, as you know, that's a, one of the main use cases that's for right. for this space. And so that's that's amazing. So that's how I actually became interested in, in the blockchain. So tell me about your first Bitcoin or blockchain transaction. <laughs> Foray into Bitcoin. So this is all my husband, I have to say. So so given that I'm a lawyer, uh, I was very skeptical when he first came to me and he, you know, he was like, hey, babe, Bitcoin, digital gold. And I was like, what are you talking about? Criminal money, I'll lose my license. Like, how dare you, right? You know. So I was very skeptical about this at the beginning. And then one day, we live in the Mission in San Francisco. Uh, we were looking out the window. We heard these helicopters circling in our neighborhoods. We look out the window, as one does, and there, we, there was like SWAT activity and all of this. And so we went on Twitter. <laughs> the news is too late, right? And we figured out that Silk Road 2, not the first one, not Ross's Silk Road, the second Silk Road was getting busted up two blocks from our apartment. And so uh, Nikhil turns to me and he's like, Bitcoin just went on sale. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine, fine, fine. This proves my point in some ways, but okay. So that's how he convinced me that let's just like buy a little bit of Bitcoin and kind of see what happens and whatnot. So it was pretty funny and pretty kind of a, a very um, abrupt entrance into, <laughs> into that whole part of things. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> so how did you actually buy your first Bitcoin? It was through an exchange and I will leave it at that for nice. security reasons. Yeah, but suffice it to say that that Bitcoin got flipped <laughs> pretty shortly thereafter because real estate in San Francisco Francisco is no joke. So we are now the proud owners of a home in San Francisco, which we're That's very excited amazing. about. And you know, <laughs> who can say if that was the good call, good call or bad call, but I'm pretty happy with where we live. Yes. So I can't complain. That's amazing. <laughs> so congratulations on your new role. You. Um, you went to CCI, Crypto Council for Innovation. Um, before you came to this new role, you were actually uh, working at the World Economic Forum, also known as WEF. Um, Tell me about your role there and your experience there. Sure, it was a fantastic experience. So uh, after I was at TechSoup and, and really went down the rabbit hole and got very obsessed with blockchain, Bitcoin, all of it, uh, what we weren't yet calling Web3, but was Web3, uh, all of these things, uh, the forum came around and, and said, look, we're opening this office in the Presidio in San Francisco. It's gonna be a tech policy center. We're looking for someone to come found the blockchain digital assets team. At the time it was called blockchain distributed ledger technology team. And I, I 
looked around, I was like, why would you think I'm the person for that? You know, but long story short, I mean, they made a hardcore a sale to me that it would be a really interesting role and they were absolutely right. So over my time there, four and a half years, I grew in the role, uh, changed the title. We talked about blockchain digital assets. We got rid of the DLT part of it, even though we still did work in that space, enterprise blockchain. Uh, and then I wound up taking over as head of the whole SF office, so running the tech policy division, basically, of um, the forum. So focusing on everything from AI to the metaverse, uh, Web3 technologies, crypto, all kinds of things. So for drones, <laughs> all kinds wow. of things. Very, very, it was very exciting. And how long were you there for? Four and a half years. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. So I started there 2017 in the fall, and then we hit bear market, which turned out was like the best thing that could possibly, I mean, I think it was the best thing that happened for a variety of reasons. People focused on building, you know, a lot of the hype kind of exited, the balloon popped a little bit, which was really needed, but it also gave me time at the forum to really make the case that this is a technology that is here to stay. It's really important. There are a lot of different applications. And we focused first on central bank digital currencies and on supply chain uses for blockchain issues some really groundbreaking work in those spaces that put us on the map as the forum. And from there, I slowly you know, started just bringing in the crypto conversation very uh, strategically, like putting it into different places. And next thing you knew, we had a Global Futures Council on cryptocurrencies uh, that was um, co-chaired by Melton Demirs and Kai Sheffield. We had all kinds of output coming out about the importance of crypto in the ecosystem. And then right before, six months before I left or so, we launched something called the Crypto Impact and Sustainability Accelerator, which I think the name alone shows how far the forum community kind of came in that time to understanding the importance of crypto uh, as just this groundbreaking technology that's going to revolutionize the way we interact with each other as a society. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really proud of the team in our time yeah. there. It was it was a phenomenal experience. And, and, and just curious, is that um, you know the, the forum itself, the councils, are they independent, or is it something that you kind of travel to home base for and kind of you know uh, yeah, have so these discussions I, there, or is it here? Like how, how does it how does yeah. it work? Well, I started all of those all those different things. So every project that came out of the blockchain team was something that you know I initiated and strategically put together, and either had to make the case for or just kind of did. Uh, the forum gave me a very long leash in terms of my opinions about what was really important um, there. But I also had our community, right? Our community is, is very diverse. We have central bankers, we have heads of state, we have uh, companies, all kinds of different companies, startups, everybody. So I was able to bring a lot of crypto native folk into the forum community and get them to engage with folks who maybe weren't necessarily thinking in the same terms or still saw Bitcoin or crypto as kind of the tool of criminals and whatnot. And we were able to have, I think, a lot of very productive behind the closed door conversations with people that I think are, I think are, are really part of the reason you see so much more understanding and acceptance and why this topic became uh, mainstreamed in many ways. I always saw my role and I see it now as normalizing crypto. I think mainstreaming crypto is really up to the builders, right? You have to get user interface that's friendly. You have to get under people understanding what they can do and how all of that needs to be a little more intuitive. Um, but in terms of taking out the fear, making people understand if you own crypto, you're not a criminal, you're not crazy, you're not throwing away your retirement money, you know, necessarily kind of careful. Um, I think all those things are how I've seen my role, both at the forum and continuing here to CCI. Right. So it's, it's it's more than just a speculative asset class. That's it's exactly. actually a technology that um, people can use up to the central banking level. That's so right. um, uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, you know, it sounds like there is a lot of policies around that, and uh, we did a lot of work with IBM on on just that. And you know, I came, for us, like we kind of came up to the conclusion of that from a regulatory technology perspective, it's it's actually safer than cash. You can track. That's each, exactly right. Each transaction. That's the irony of it. The right? irony like, of it. are always going to want to use right. the good old dollar. <laughs> you know? Yes, that's right. right that's <laughs> right. Just, yeah. That actual cash is the number one form of money laundering. That's right. Right. We've all so. seen Breaking Bad. We know. <laughs> money heist. <laughs> that's right. That's, <laughs> that's right. reason. That's reason. That's right. So that's amazing. <laughs> Very interesting that you were able to take the leaders that do today's monetary policy and then put them together with the innovators and have them collaborate and, and kind of get to that conclusion. So very impressive. You know, life is relationships. And so to me, it was really important that both sides understand that there are well-intentioned people who are doing what they know and who are uh, maybe need to be brought along. I think it's so important when we talk about crypto and we, we advocate in this space to meet people where they are. You know, it's, it's easy to get frustrated at perceptions that people are kind of clinging to legacy technologies or whatnot, but there are reasons for that. And those reasons aren't malevolent in most cases. In most cases, there's just a, a desire to be cautious with something that is truly as groundbreaking 
as as this technology. I think of myself, you know, in my first reaction to hearing about Bitcoin, as I've told you, was criminal money. You know, my law license will be taken away if I engage with that. That was my first reaction. And that wasn't like a crazy reaction. I was wrong, clearly, but it took some bringing along for me to understand that. And for me, you know, the, the trick to getting me to understand this was actually focusing on the technology itself. So once I understood that from this kind of data web three layer, then I saw, oh, now I really get it. And of course, my fascination over the over many years with how hard it is to move money across borders became, it became really, really clear to me that that was a killer use case for something like Bitcoin or crypto. And then it just was like a matter of, you know, I couldn't get there fast enough. But my initial reaction was definitely predicated on what I was hearing in the media and kind of what, uh, what these perceptions were. And Unfortunately, that is not necessarily that different today. There's a lot of... That's right. That was, that was actually <laughs> yeah. my next question was like, how do you think the, the media um, kind of shaped this narrative? You know, and what I, could be changed there? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I think that the people who are generally speaking about this uh, come from one particular point of view. So they generally tend to be investors, people who are who have made a lot of money in this space, who are focusing on that. They tend to be white men of a certain age, of a certain nationality, usually American, not always. Uh, and that's who you see. And that's who kind of gets a lot of the press. And so I do think there's this perception that this is just the next tool of the ruling class to make a lot of money at the expense of everybody else which could not be further from the truth. Now, that I do think that's happening. There are a lot of people who are making a tremendous amount of money because they have the cultural privilege, they have the ability to have gotten in there early. They could take that kind of risk, right? But they had enough money to take that kind of risk and whatnot. Um, but there are many people who are at the exact opposite end of the spectrum who are also taking advantage of this technology and who are finding it to be a tool of empowerment, which I think is extremely exciting and important. So all those things are true and we're just not doing a good enough job, I think, as a society in surfacing the stories of people who are not, you know, kind of from this very media, the media norm kind of kind of model. Definitely needs to be an evolution of that and a yes. shift in, in storyline. There's a lot of amazing things that incredible things are happening and I hope that we can highlight some of that That's here cool. on. <laughs> on this uh, on this series. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Those of us who know and who have those kinds of connections and experiences really need to be amplifying those voices because they are very, they're, they're really, they're not even that hard to find, as you know. Yes. They're really out there. It's they're just a there. matter of getting it, them the attention right. and saying, this is also real. Like, yes, speculation is, is real as a use case. Let's not pretend it isn't, right? There are plenty of people who are flipping NFTs that are nonsense just to make a lot of money, and that is true. Also, people who historically have been excluded from legacy financial systems, the reasons that really not good reasons, right? They're, they're just about like some centralized institution making a risk assessment that just excised a whole portion of the population. It's not a good reason. I mean, it makes sense. I can understand it, but you know, they're also finding empowerment and they're also finding ways to make less money, but nevertheless, like to provide streams of income, to provide wealth creation generation for themselves, their families and their communities. And again, I, I just think those, I think those stories need to be told with the same frequency as the other stories. And then I think we'll see a very different approach uh, to both policymaking and regulation. But also, I think the sense of this is something that is relegated to the uber wealthy will hopefully dissipate very quickly. I love that. That's super insightful. It's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> so what is your take on crypto regulation and governance around the world? Mm. Well, first of all, I would say around the world is key. So I think it's really important that everybody remembers this is a global technology. And I think of it kind of like an amoeba. There's this sense, I think, in some jurisdictions, the U.S. is one of them, that if you know we regulate it here in one way, then we're going to kill it dead in some fashion, right? Or the parts of it that we don't like are never going to appear somewhere else. That's just not the case. It's an amoeba. If you push it here, it's going to kind of swoop over here. And I think there are a lot of jurisdictions poised to, if the U.S. screws it up and if we push this, tremendous economic growth engine somewhere else, someone else is going to take it. I mean, they're ready for that. I do think there are jurisdictions that will mimic what the U.S. does, but the important thing to remember is it's a global technology. Global coordination is something that we'd love to see, and I've been saying this since my time at the forum. I think there needs to be an understanding of what this is and what it isn't. Uh, separately from that, I think there are some jurisdictions who are really forward-thinking. Uh, Bermuda, for example, you know, a year ago, I think now, um, passed some very forward-thinking regulation designed to attract businesses and industry to Bermuda to say, look, we're here to be friendly. We have strict financial regulation where we're seen as kind of a, a safe place to do business. At the same time, we want to make sure that we are creating enough of enough room for innovators to really experiment here and create pilots. There are some sandboxes happening where you can kind of come into the fold, have a conversation uh, with regulators in certain parts of the world, and then you can kind of see together, like, oh, does this make sense? What the consequences, what's happening here. 
Contrast, you know, the U.S., where we're seeing a lot, of, particularly with the SEC, we're seeing a lot of action through enforcement. So the SEC kind of going after someone and one by one, almost it almost seems like one by one, like in this targeted approach and saying, OK, that thing doesn't work or you need to come with an existing rules and regulations or existing laws. And the danger there is, you know, I describe this a lot, like with every time you're getting something new, you can think about the Internet and I won't go down that. There's a whole lot of people you can kind of look up to find about the, the comparison right. there. right? But, but we're at a similar time in terms of the scope of we just don't know what's going to be built upon blockchains. We just don't know. That's right. The same way in the early internet, you know, I was of, a, of an age where, you know, Pine and all these kinds of things, right? You were like poking people and fingering people and this kind of stuff, right? Because that's what the language we were using, very rudimentary kinds of things. No one saw Google coming and it took some time for that to come. There is, There are things like that that are going to be developed on a blockchain and we don't know what they are. So we have to be very careful about allowing for that innovation. Now, you could certainly argue Google has pros and cons, search as a general matter, pros and cons, social media pros and cons. Nevertheless, I think we would say, I would certainly argue we're better off with some of these things than we were. And I think that what we're trying to do now is understand where did it kind of go wrong in terms of consumer protection around the data part of it and yank some of that back. That's what Web3 can do. It can have a different approach to these kinds of things, right? But I don't think any of us would say the internet categorically a terrible thing unless we're like full on Luddites, which no, it's are. completely changed the world. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's what this is going to be. There is going to be a revolution and it's already starting. So how do we kind of get to a place where that's allowed? At the same time, there are some guardrails around it. And I don't think an enforcement like going company by company and saying you're doing this right and wrong is the right thing. I also talk about this a lot like like a duck. Let's say you have a bird and you're like, I've never, this is a brand new, I've never seen this bird before. Now, parts of it, oh, it's, okay, it's got webbed feet, it's got feathers, it must be a duck. And the more you treat it like a duck and you regulate it like a duck, well, you can't be surprised if it starts quacking. And the danger there is that all the things that really made it a peacock are lost, right? And so what I worry about in the United States and what we're kind of seeing, like an agency by agency, there's, and even within agencies, there's a very wide, uh, you opinions. know, distinction, yeah. opinions, exactly, in how to treat this. But I, I see a lot of like duck-like approach, like, well, it's what we had before, it's the same thing, therefore regulated the same way. And next thing you know, you're going to have just a bunch of maybe different colored ducks running around in these exchanges. And that's not at all what I think we need. Because as we were speaking about earlier, the whole point of this is to create more inclusion points and more access to people that have been left out of those legacy systems by definition. So when you talk about historically excluded communities, there's a reason that a lot of those folks have not been able to access some of this ways that they can kind of improve their lives, better their lives, families, create wealth, all these kinds of opportunities that really would be life changing for them. Anyway, so these are things I worry about. I am not thrilled, you know, by what we see, uh, in, again, in some particular approaches in the United States. There are others. There are plenty of folks in the United States in positions of leadership, lawmakers and policymakers, regulators, who I think are, are very, really do understand the potential of crypto, um, are very much in, in favor of it, are really understanding not only the innovation side of it, but also the inclusion side of it. And so my hope is that those voices, well, there'll be more and more of those voices. And part of my goal is to help make that happen. This is so amazing. What you're touching on is that we're still at the very beginning. It sounds like um, very much like the internet, we have product market fit, uh, but we don't quite have channel product market fit. And we're still getting there and discovering all these key use cases for this technology. And, you know, what you said really resonated with me because you're saying basically like all of the traditional, uh, traditional patterns that we use, you know, today for some like regulatory purposes, whether it be like financial services or security laws, may not necessarily apply to, uh, you know, what the use case that we're doing it today. So it's almost like we have to, you know, respect and take some of those experiences, but almost come up with a new system for the technology itself. I think that's exactly right. Right. And why would we think that something that's brand new we don't want to push it in a way and more like I, my kids play a lot with play-doh and i'm always like oh they have these like devices where you can like make a square of the play-doh and you fill it up right and i'm like oh now you have a square <laughs> you know like it's it went from this amazing blank canvas of a thing and then you pushed it through a mold and that's really cool and interesting and it's good for your dexterity and all that kind of stuff but now you just have that thing and that is less interesting to me than the blank canvas that the play-doh was so it may be a bad metaphor but i think the idea here is you know let's let this kind of flourish at least a bit and let's understand and do that together. So, uh, you know, the forum is all about public-private collaboration, cross-sector stakeholder engagement. I'm bringing that to CCI as well. I really do think that there needs to be more conversation and more understanding happening, more relationships built in the public-private sector. 
and understand like where can the industry actually be engaging in some self-regulation or self-policing because industry doesn't have interest in this being branded as the tool of criminals or fraudulent behavior either, right? But we have to also get there and figure out what are the most effective tools for making that activity very, very, very challenging to do because it's always going to be possible if people are creative enough and motivated enough, but making it very, very hard to do, making the deterrent hard and also making it really easy to catch. And those are things that I think we're starting to focus more and more attention on as an industry and ecosystem as well. You mentioned CCI. Let's let's kind of transition over to that. Yeah. Congratulations on your new role. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Two weeks in, so you know, I have a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <It's> amazing. <laughs> I, I hear you. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> um, you tell me more about what CCI is, what your role there is. You know where you see. Sure. Uh, you know that organization in the next 18 months. Absolutely. So we're a global alliance of industry leaders. We are thinking across the spectrum, across the world, how do we create evidence-based advocacy models? So uh, some of that evidence we have to generate. Maybe it's detailed research, papers into national security, into cybersecurity, into privacy, into all these different kinds of concepts, uh, energy, all these things that are really important. And then how do we use that evidence that we generate uh, to advocate on behalf of users of crypto? So I really see myself as somebody who wants to speak for the voices of users of crypto. Um, my members are a bunch of people, different companies that have a lot of users. We tend to be some of the leading uh, you know, uh, user base in, in the ecosystem. And so the goal here is to say, how do we protect access and opportunity for people to actually use some of these services and products? And how do we make that broader? We focus on open permissionless decentralized systems. Uh, decentralization is a core tenet of what we're here to preserve because I think that, you know, we have to be practical about this. There are elements of centralization that come with human behavior. And sometimes when it's fully decentralized, like you see in some DAOs, there's toxicity that lives there. So we have to be mindful of that as well. Like I, I tend to think that, you know, entropy is real and I, we've, I've seen yellow jackets. I understand kind of where things go when left to their own devices, the Lord of the Flies. Nevertheless, I think with some structure around some of these things, they are going to prove to be a tool of empowerment for a lot of people. And so the goal is to preserve the aspects of the technology uh, that make that more possible and more likely, um, and then see, you know, where, where our time takes us. So we speak to you know, policymakers, regulators all around the world. We also speak to regular people, just kind of to say, like, here is why you shouldn't be afraid of this technology. Um, you don't necessarily have to understand the technology itself, but don't be afraid of getting a wallet, trying some of these things. You know, it's, it's not going to be the terrifying thing you might think it is. That's right. It can be very intimidating because it, it, it seems very technical to some people, especially on the consumer level. It's spoken about that way. Yeah. Which yeah. is, I think, a little unfortunate. You know, yeah. like, I don't know how my phone I, works. I, I use it all the time. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I think there's going to be an evolution of that. So I think so. You know, I, I think one of our co core goals here at Stronghold, um, we are blockchain and cryptocurrency and payments company, but is I actually think that when you cross the caption to women, to like having the adoption of like women having um, creating wallets and learning more about the technology, or just not even learning more about the technology, just using it. Um, that that's going to be just, you know, the, 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 the chasm that we need to cross it to. I think so, too. I mean, I think, you know, we already know that women drive consumer decision making in households, and that's true around the world. And I think there's a new generation coming of digital natives who are going to be crypto natives. So I talk about my three daughters a lot as, as, as girls who will be crypto native. Like they will have a very different understanding of the engagement model. And I can fully expect my daughter, who's now nine going on 13, to tell me, you know, in the next decade, like, I can't believe you ever posted a photo to a platform. Like, what were you thinking, mom? Like, how, you know, that's crazy. You know, um, you were just being scraped and exploited or whatever. I can completely see that kind of transition happening because the way that they interact digitally and it's it's just so fluid you know and so it's become that for me because I'm in tech but I think most of my peer most of my law school classmates and others who aren't necessarily as tech savvy or tech forward it's not as fluid for them like they very much have an online they go online and then they go offline right whereas for most of us who work in these fields you're kind of fluid in your identity across these things and that's becoming more and more the norm that's right that's right and, and then to your point is that it's it's going to be user facing and it's going to be more and more the norm, but you don't really necessarily have to know how the technology That's works. Right. It's not like, you know, we're on Facebook or Google and we ask them, hey, what's your database? Like, I'm going to know what the answer of that is. And I think that maybe that's what we typically ask in this space. So it has some evolving of language that needs to happen um, to get more usability. Yeah. And I think that the, the, almost the bigger, the bigger barrier to entry for folks is that they think they have to 
like, what's a hard wallet? What's a cold, cold store? How do I do? You're like, well, you don't really have to, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> you don't really have to do any of that, you know? So I, and I do think that, again, you know, as a society, we empower wealthy people to take more risks than people who don't have so much money. And so there's a reason this has started, I think, at the upper echelons of income and wealth in our society. You've got wealth advisors now advising on crypto holdings as part of a diversified retirement portfolio, for example, right? Um, but I think we need to really step away from that a little bit and say, okay, that's because, you know, it, Bitcoin has been very volatile. And so I think there were folks that were like, well, can I, am I going to be savvy enough to know when to exit and when to enter and all that kind of stuff, right? So I don't lose a lot of, a lot of, of value that's really, really critical to my family's well-being. It's like I can, I can put some, you know, I can dabble a bit in this, right? If you don't have that dabble ability, then I think we need to think about how are we creating the same opportunities for folks like that. That to me is, it just has to be a priority. And if we don't prioritize it as an industry, it's not going to happen. So part of what I'm, you know, I want to do is really say, like, again, evidence-based advocacy. We have to demonstrate this is happening. We have to show how it's happening. And we have to really be intentional about creating inclusive models or we are going to wind up in a world where this is yet another kind of tool of super wealthy people to just kind of like make even more money on top of their money. And that is certainly not, not you know, what I'm here to do. That's amazing work. <laughs> Thanks. That's an amazing mission. Go, yeah, Sheila. It's a legacy, right? Okay, like, yeah, you think about good. what do you want to do? I'm at a that's point right. in my life yeah. where I'm like, that's oh, amazing. you know, like, what do I want to be able to say that I, yeah. I at least fought for? That's super, that's super for, impactful. So. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you for all the work that you do. <laughs> well, thank you that's for that. that's amazing. It. <laughs> Tell us more about you and what makes you tick? What drives the behavior in you to want to fulfill that mission? A great question. You know, I think um, I'm bicultural. So I was born and raised in the United States, spent a lot of time in India and saw a lot of really deep poverty um, just when I was visiting. Uh, I also have a mother who is much more left-leaning and a father who is much more conservative. And so our dinner table was a lot of discussion about, you know, taxes and why they're good or bad and like unionization and why that matters and all this kind of stuff. My mother, funny story, my grandfather um, owned a lot of farms uh, in Southern India. And my mother was there like with the workers, basically like you know, union, whatever the equivalent of unionization was like back in like the 60s in India, you know, she was like all into it, you know. So I had this very different, whereas my dad's like a Reaganite. So it has very, very different influences. And I see, I can understand kind of th those um, predilections, I think. Uh, for me, you know, I think just seeing that not everyone in the world has the privilege that I had and being intimately aware of what life would have been like for me if I did grow up in India versus growing up here, I'm lucky my parents were privileged in India, we were able, they were able to emigrate to the United States, right, during very restricted immigration laws. And just the flow of people, like who was allowed to come to the United States and who wasn't, all these things I think are just, are, are really powerful. So for me in law school, I had the privilege of studying with Professor Lonnie Guineer, who recently passed away, she's a mentor of mine, and she, I took a class on critical race theory, and I really got to understand how nothing's accidental, how systems were really built uh, deliberately. And, and either they were built deliberately to include certain folks or prioritize certain folks, or they were built deliberately to exclude others. And both those things are true. And I think the history of racial oppression in the United States is a very obvious example of that. So I sit on boards. I sit on a lot of boards uh, thinking about uh, equal justice, thinking about ACLU. I'm on the board of ACLU Northern California. Thinking about people's rights and thinking about how do we create more empowerment in society. It's something that's been important to me throughout my entire life. So, and the studies I've done have kind of just, if anything, they've made that more powerful. And then coming into tech and just seeing at the time, like law even, and tech, they were such male-dominated industries. And just seeing, you know, there were challenges. Like I, I again, I had the credentials, I had the an educational background and privilege to be able to enter those spaces and enter them with credibility. And I also was just a kind of person who, through a variety of things that happened in my life, I had a lot of confidence and I wasn't overly burdened by what people thought about me in those spaces, right? I was happy to have to be in those spaces and I wasn't ever afraid of speaking up for people more like me in those spaces. Um, from the beginning of when I entered them. But I think that that's unusual and I recognize it's unusual. And so I always wanted to be able to use my voice and raise my kids, you know, themselves to kind of say, like in our family, we talk a lot about like, how were we kind today? And who did, how did we help? Were we, were we there for somebody today? Or someone there for us today? And we celebrate those kinds of things, you know? So it's just um, compassion and empathy, I think are just things that are, are getting lost, I think, in our in our society. And to me, that's kind of the framework for for all these things. But I also, I really think a lot about the fact that, you know, the least among us, right? Like whatever's happening with them is affecting all of us. There's a reason that we're seeing more crime in cities. There's a reason that we're seeing uh, anxiety on the uprise. Like a lot of that's rooted in financial privilege or the lack thereof. And so if there's an opportunity to create more opportunities for others who haven't had access to some of these, you know, these kinds of mechanisms, then to me, that seems like something that's just 
it's, it's root cause, you know, it's fundamental to the problem. You can't be uh, focusing on other kinds of things if you're worried about where your next meal is coming from, or if you're worried about whether you're gonna lose your home. So I don't know, to me, it's just, it's been my entire life. And, and this just seems like the latest instance of something where we have this unique once in a lifetime, once in a generation chance to build a better system. So why wouldn't I put my all and all my energy into, into trying to see that come to fruition? That's amazing. That's noble. Being the voice of folks that may not be able to, to articulate that or have the space to articulate, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the financial inclusion or exclusion um, that they have. I don't flatter myself, right? I think there are plenty, there, there are so many, we need to hear from those people because, you know, I, I didn't grow up like that, you know, and I think there are, there are people that are, more, that are, can tell a story that's very personal to them about how, you know, um, something like crypto provided an opportunity, right? And so I just think those stories need to be told to the extent that I can draw connections and I can help amplify that, then that's how I see the role. But I think you just need people who, who do have access, right? I do have access to a lot of spaces that many folks will never have access to. And so I just think it's important to to raise awareness and to bring these um, sensitivities and these understandings into some of those conversations where they don't normally exist. So when you are a little girl at the dinner table and there is... <laughs> very, <you> know, dramatic. <laughs> very, very dramatic. Very dramatic, yes. <laughs> Sounds like people with two opposite spectrums from political sector, but still <laughs> were in love. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we were yeah, certainly a family. There was never any question about yeah. that. But I mean, that's very, like, very, that's pretty very amazing. vehement disagreement. On yeah, things, you but, know? That's, so, but that's super healthy because you got to see both sides of the story, right? I have seen the ability to forge alliances across yeah. different political views. Right. Let me put it that way. Exactly. Right? Like I grew up with that. At the dinner table. I grew up with that. Almost every day, you know, there was something going on. And so... Uh, you know, it was, it was powerful. And I think that, you know, my parents responded to their immigration story very differently. Um, my mother was always intimately aware of like, well, we were able to come. Not everybody was able to come. My father was like, well, we earned the right to come. Like we did these things. You know, it was a very different approach to these things, right? Um, and I, when I studied immigration history and immigration law, I was like, oh, my mom is really right on that one. <laughs> you know, like in the 65 Immigration Act, like doctor who was allowed to come from India and certain other countries, it was like professional doctors primarily, right? There's a reason that doctors in the United States are so many Indian doctors. There's a reason for that. It's our immigration pattern. It's not coincidence, you know? So I think people don't understand these things and they don't realize the impact that these invisible or even like these predate my birth. Like I, I wasn't born in 65, but these things predate all of that. But there's a reason that so many of my friends who were Indian, who were in, who we went to certain universities because we had parents who were raised with high education or who were in graduate school. Like, again, it's not a coincidence. And so, so many of these things I think are invisible to people because they don't pay attention and they, and it's, they just don't realize that policy is like the number, it just, it has such tremendous impact on the trajectory of people's lives. And so the idea to, again, to engage in policy at a fundamental level on something as profound as uh, Web3 and the blockchain and crypto, uh, to me, like we are shaping what's going to happen for my great grandchildren's generation, you know, and we're doing that today, the same way that the 65 Immigration Act shaped the ability of my parents to come here, which is the reason that my children now live in you know, San Francisco and are being raised in this environment. So none of these things are accidental. They are all, you only can make the choices that the world permits you to make in many cases, and we don't really want to admit that, but that's a fact. And so let's make sure that that set of choices is as broad as possible for as many people as possible. That's impressive and powerful. <laughs> Very self-aware as well. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, I've had time to, <laughs> time to reflect in my life. Yeah. So just to kind of bring it all together here at Stronghold, we are, you know, all about increasing uh, the accessibility and for financial services and technology for all, including, you know, overlooked and underrepresented people. And, and that includes women, people of color, um, you know, and uh, we're super aligned with your mission. And you have a ton of experience with TechSoup and uh, WEF and CCI, and, and, and you've talked to so you have so many data points back to you, you know, having a, a history and data, and it sounds like you're just pulling it all together with, with some of the things that you're doing even today. So you have so many data points. Tell us what what is going well and what could we be doing more of? I think it's things we've touched on. You know, we really need to be recognizing that there's so much talent in this space outside of the usual, you know graduates of certain institutions or the certain kind of profile that tends to get a lot of attention from the media or from others, right? 
Um, and amplifying that talent, I think it's really important. I think we have new ways of doing that now. I think it's really amazing to be seeing crypto at a time when we have so many different access uh, points for people to, you know, whether it's podcasts or whether it's um, you know, even YouTube, whatever it is to kind of get messaging out, but we have to pay more attention to the messages coming from different parts of the world. And so I have my own podcast, Money Reimagined, and we try very much to kind of bring those voices to tell their stories about why this is important and interesting from the empowerment side. But I also think it's just about getting more people into this industry. So we just need to hire. You know, people are like, oh, your team at the forum was all women. Like, how amazing. And I'm like, really, no, though. I just hired the best people who applied, the best candidates for women. I had an all women team. That's just kind of what happened. My starting team here at CCI is also all women. I have some hires I'm announcing shortly that are going to be, you know, women because that's the best people who applied. So I think we have to just kind of um, not think about things as um, unusual anymore. You know, it's not unusual to see talent from people of color, from women, from people who didn't go to elite institutions. It's normal. <laughs> it's very normal. It's a matter of just seeking out that talent and then growing that talent and making sure you have a culture at every institution of, or at every company of inclusion to kind of say, like, you're here for a reason. What Your perspective really matters. It's important to round out how we're thinking about this brand new thing that nobody really knows. No, there's no one in the world that can claim to understand exactly what's going to happen with Web3 and crypto. There is, that person doesn't exist. A lot of us have good guesses and we have very educated and informed guesses about what could happen, but we don't know what's going to happen. So what's going to happen is going to be dependent on who actually has their hands in shaping this space. So I'm really honored to be in a position where I can help do some of that shaping. Uh, and my, my, my goal is to create an environment where more and more people um, can participate actively in this ecosystem and, and, and use it to their own uh, benefit and their community and family's benefits. But I also think we need to be taking a broader approach to that and doing it on an industry-wide basis. Thank you for sharing and thank yeah. you for coming. It's such a pleasure. Thank uh, you for having me, Tammy. Yeah, thank you really for fun. coming today. And just so we can tell yeah, mm -hmm. people who are who are watching, where can we where can we find you on on the internet? Yeah, I'm on the, all the places. So uh, Twitter, my Twitter handle is at Sheila underscore Warren. Uh, the CCI website is CryptoCouncil.org. And I, I have a podcast, Money Reimagined, on the Coindesk Network. So those are three very easy places to see what I'm up to. Amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.